there any kids that want to go back to Miss Sherry? We have little ones today. Oh, Sherry has a big one. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> Relax, Sherry. You get to suit with your husband today. <laughs> All right. It's good to see everybody. Acts chapter 13. I'd invite you to turn there. We had an interesting week this week. Um, some of you know we talked about our little Pakistani uh, endeavor, Bible studies that I was doing with a pastor, a little house church in Pakistan. That we got uh, blocked this week. Oh. Right as I was ready to give the Bible lesson, yeah. got cut off. So uh -oh. I'm not sure what's going on with that. But let's pray for our brothers and sisters in other countries where they're not as free as we are. I told you, I, I did the Bible studies at 7 in the morning here, but it would be 7 o'clock at night. And they met under the cover of darkness, so uh, do the Bible classes. But uh, we got cut off, so we'll pray for them. We'll pray that God continue to use them, uh, use the pastor there. I won't mention his name as he ministers to the people in his house church. But it's good to see some people who we have prayed for. Tracy, we prayed for her. Yeah. Look, God has raised her up. Thank you. That's good to see. Ralph came back from the Cook Islands. I was, I was afraid he was going to be fishing, you know, for the rest of his life out of that easy chair, you know, right on. But he came back to, to Paulden. Or to Gallifrey County. That's why it's come back. Oh. I want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And others that have been ill. And, uh, she got to that brand new citizenship. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So it's good. God is good. So let me read Acts chapter 13. You'll see up here I have one verse. Uh, in your bulletins, I had uh, written a different sermon title. And sometimes that happens. Early in the week, I think of a sermon title and it kind of marinates in my mind. But yesterday, I was looking at it again, and I said, you know what, I can't, I can't rush through this one verse. We have got to unpack what was going on in Acts chapter 13, verse 14. So we're going to look at, let me begin reading with verse 13. This is Acts 13, 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. And they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So let me just uh, review a little bit about what we talked about last week. Let's see here. Yeah, there we are. Uh, we were looking at verse 13 where it says, Paul and Barnabas loosed from Paphos. Now that's at the western edge of the island of Cyprus and they sailed from there up to the mainland and we talked about how in verse 13 it came to Pamphylia that's the area the town of Perga and I showed you a map of how that was a coastal area completely surrounded on three sides by mountains kind of isolated kind of like the wild west lots of stuff going on there wasn't a big Roman presence there and uh they arrived at that place, and then it says John departed from them and returned. We talked about the word return. He abandoned is the word. He left them, and he went home. And we talked about why that might be, just to rehearse in your mind a little bit. Remember we talked about this? Why would people abandon? Why would people leave a commitment? Because he had committed to travel on this trip with Paul and Barnabas, his cousin Barnabas. Why? And I threw out a couple ideas. We don't know for sure, but we know by the language that he abandoned the team. It wasn't like, oh, well, you know, see you guys later. I think I'll know. I'm out of here. That's basically what he said. He had committed to travel. He broke his commitment and he went home. Later, when they begin on their second missionary journey, remember we get to Acts chapter 15, Paul says, let's go again and visit the churches. And Barnabas says, okay, let's take John Mark. And Paul says, absolutely not. He is not going with me. And the contention was so great between Paul and Barnabas, they split. 
So whatever the reason that John left the team, Paul was not happy. And he was not going to take that quitter along on another trip. Though it was serious business in Paul's mind. So we put all that together. Paul was driven. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. For me to live is Christ. Paul was goal driven. And when he had a young man along that abandoned the team, he couldn't handle that. And he wasn't going to bring him along on the next trip. Okay, so we talked about that. What does it take for someone to quit? Quit. They get offended. And I showed you a bunch of funny ones there, right? People get offended because their their casserole wasn't commented or complimented as much at the dinner, so they I'm out of here. I'm leaving this church. Nobody likes my food. Or whatever. The pastor didn't shake my hand at the door. I mean, though, there are some ridiculous reasons why people quit, right? A commitment. And that's why we're saying we're making a kind of a big deal about church membership because you're committing to say, I want to be a part of this. And so I said to you last week, I said, I'm not perfect. And not if it happens, but when it happens. <laughs> I'm going to say something that somebody's not going to like. So my question is, what are you going to do? You're going to quit and go home? Are you going to turn around like John Mark and say, I'm out of here. I don't like the direction this is going. I don't like, I thought this was going to be a better trip. But look, we're in a really dangerous area. And there's a lot of mosquitoes around here. Paul even, get, Paul even got sick because when he gets to Antioch, we see later, he's sick. So whatever happened in that Pamphylia area was not good for their health. What about you? Am I going to say something that you're going to say, oh, I didn't like that. Pastor didn't do this. Or, well, we said there's reasons to leave a church. If a pastor begins to preach heresy or is, there's an abuse of power, you leave a church. That's a yeah. legitimate reason. But short of that, what, you don't like the color of the curtains? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you don't like that they didn't have the coffee ready? Is that a reason? <laughs> Come on, there's offense. <laughs> we get offended about things, don't we? But are they really that important? <laughs> and I, as a final example I gave you last week, this is all rehearsed for some of you that were here. You remember this. We were up in Colorado taking care of our grandkids for, I don't know how many days, I lost track. <laughs> but uh, two of them in diapers. Listen, when those kids mess their diapers, and it's been a long time since I changed diapers, but I had to do that. Am I gonna reject those kids because they mess their diapers? I might say, oh, that's nasty. But is that a big enough offense that I'm going to put them out on the curb and say, you're out of here. You're not part of this family because I don't like that. No, the relationship is so important that you just deal with it and move on. And I encourage you, when you are committed to something like the church, the relationship is so important that offenses, they're going to come and they're going to go. Jesus said offenses are going to always be there. But what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let them be more important than the relationship? I hope not. And I hope that if you're offended about something, you come and talk to us. Talk to us. And if I've said something that offended you, I'll apologize. I'll be the first one to say, I didn't mean that. Okay? A sister came to me last week and talked about something. I won't look in the direction of that sister. <laughs> we talked about it. It was fine. But it could have been an offense. Right, Marilyn? <laughs> it could have been a big offense. Oh, <laughs> now I won't. I won't go there because someone might get offended that I said it. No, but that's what it should be. The relationship is more important than a silly offense, right? And I hope you all agree with me on that. So let's move to verse fourteen. So they left Perga, coastal town. Mosquitoes, swampy, even to this day. And it says they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now, let me show you a little map here because this is going to be important. <coughs> well, let me just say here. Paul and Barnabas made the 100-mile trip from Perga up to Antioch from sea level to 3,600 feet. Now, I'm going to compare that to something so as to kind of put us into this story. 
It was a steep ascent and it was a very dangerous road. So let me show you the picture here. Here's a picture. Oh, can you see that? Not really. You can't really see it. Perga is right there and Antioch's at the top. Okay. That would be similar to us walking from Mesa below Phoenix on the Salt River. Now I know Phoenix is about 500 feet, so let's assume it's coastal, sea level. And going all the way up the mountain, I-17, on foot, all the way to Cordes, about 3,600 feet, something like that. They did this on foot. This was no easy task. This was not for the faint of heart. You know, when Luke says here in verse 14, they departed from Perga, they got to Antioch. Perga, Antioch. But do you realize what that involved? That was days and days of travel up the mountains on foot from coastal to 3,600 feet, up rugged terrain all the way to the top. Maybe that's one of the reasons John Mark quit. Would you like to walk from Mesa all the way to Cordes on foot? I'm not talking about I-17, beautiful highway. I'm talking about little roads through the crags and the rocks. And this was a huge undertaking, folks. So verse 14, they departed from Perga. They came to Antioch. This isn't the original Antioch they left over on the mainland. This is Antioch in Pisidia. And it says they came and went into the synagogue. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. There's a book written called Progression by Intention. And here's what the author says. This kind of jumped out at me as I looked at this. This passage teaches us an important mission law. We won't re reach the nations apart from personal sacrifice. That's what Luke is trying to show us. He didn't explain the ascent. He didn't explain coast to high level mountains because as we read this, we should know this. We should be good students of the word and know Perga's down there and Antioch's up there. So he doesn't have to explain it. What he's telling us is this was a huge undertaking and we won't reach the nations apart from a personal sacrifice. I want to let that sink in folks. This is what the word is teaching us. This was not easy. Paul and Barnabas undertook an incredible, incredible amount of work. Let me just throw out a little application. What are we willing to sacrifice to reach people who don't know about God? This should put us to shame, folks. I've been on mission trips too. And we get upset when we have a flat tire, you know, yeah. or, or something happens. We go, oh no, what are we going to do? Really? Is a flat tire that big of a problem? Look at what these guys endured. I'll tell you what happened one time on a mission trip. We, we went to, I went down to Phoenix and we had two vehicles, two vans with two trailers. And we were going to go to two different towns. We we're going to cross over to Mexico and then split, go to two towns. In one of the towns, we were going to have hot dogs. And in the other town, because we always provide a meal. In one, we were going to have hot dogs. And in the other one, they were going to make sandwiches. Well, guess what happened? We got, we got to our town, and I opened the trailer. Now, someone else was in charge of packing the, the trailers, okay? Not me. I had delegated. But I think I made a fatal mistake. <laughs> I didn't vet the uh, person who was supposed to do it. We get to our town. I opened the door. We had all the buns. All the hot dogs went to the other one. <laughs> so we had buns, and we had bread. That's all we had. All the hot dogs, all the sandwich fixings, they all went to the other town. And I went, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? For us, that was a huge problem. But you know what? We went with the flow. We had buns, we had bread, and nothing else. So we went to a local store and bought a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> made peanut butter sandwiches. And then they had to go to a store somewhere and find bread for their hot dogs. You know what? That was a huge thing, but not like this. Not like this, folks. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, 
perils by my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils by in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, and hunger and thirst and fastings often cold and nakedness. Paul is describing his trips. And he says, here's what we faced. Now, we don't know exactly when. You can go through each one of these. You, we don't know exactly when he had perils of robbers. We don't know. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? He went from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was traveling by himself. And what happened? He fell among robbers. He stripped him, took his clothes, took his money, and beat him up and left him there. And then the others walking by, they... They realized, oh, there's robbers around. I better get out of here. They just stepped around and kept going. See, this was common in those days. When you traveled on these roads, could it be that between Perga and Antioch, he faced some robbers? We don't know. But he does say he faced them in his ministry. Perils by his own countrymen. Perils by the heathen. You think there were people along the way that didn't want to listen to him? Perils in the wilderness, yeah. Perils in the sea, well, that was before he got the land. Weariness, you think he'd get a little weary going all the way from Mesa to Cordes by, on foot, going up the, through the mountains? Yeah. With no son of <laughs> Painfulness, yeah. Hunger, thirst, cold. You're down at the coast. You're dressed for the coast. You go up in the mountains, it's cold. and it's cold up there. Yeah. All right. So it could be that this happened on this trip. We don't know. But we know it was a dangerous trip all the way from one to the other. Now, let's continue here. Verse 14, it says, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, I'm going to ask you the question, why did Paul go to the synagogue? You know, in each town, if there were 10 families that were Jewish, they could form a synagogue. That was a requirement. You had to have at least 10. So what Paul would do, he's never been to this town. It's on a major east-west highway, Roman road, so it's well-traveled. And he found a synagogue. That means there were at least 10 families there. So my question is, why did he go to the synagogues? Paul was supposed to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? He was the one that was going to go and open and go out to the Gentiles. Remember when Ananias was sent to lay hands on him because he was blind, fell off. Remember, he met the Lord. God told Ananias, go, because this man is a chosen man who is going to go before kings and princes and spread my name through the world. God had already said that. That was his job. But it's interesting that he went to the synagogue. Now I'm going to ask you the question, why would he go to the synagogue when he was there to talk to all the Gentiles? Well, let me read Romans chapter 10. When Paul is talking about his earnest desire, his heart, he had it in his heart to reach the Jewish people, even though he was preaching to Gentiles. Let me read this. Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Even though he would speak to Gentiles, he still had in his heart a desire for Israel. Remember what Israel had done. Israel had rejected their Messiah. Jesus came with a legitimate offer. Here I am. What'd they do? Well, a week before his crucifixion, they said, Hoshiana. Lord, save us. He's here. He's here. And they threw palm branches. You know the story. A week later, what did they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. We don't want him. We don't want him. So he came and legitimately offered himself as Messiah. What did they do? We don't want you. Oh. So Israel rejected their Messiah. But what did God do? He said, okay. And if you read the book of Romans, Paul explains this. Judicial blindness came over them. God said, okay, you've rejected, you're going to be blind. And even to this day, it's very difficult for a Jewish person to recognize their Messiah. They just don't see it. They can read it in the word, but they go, I just don't see it. Why? They're blind. And God said, okay, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. 
You'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. So God then opened the door to the Gentiles, but Paul still had in his heart that desire that Israel would be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. What's that mean? Paul says, they want to serve God, but they don't realize that God came in the flesh. He provided a way of salvation. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What's that mean? Well, this is what Paul preached. Remember all those things we did back here in the law? They were to bring us to Christ. We've talked about this, the lamb sacrifice. What did they do? What did the lamb's blood do? It covered the sins for thousands of years. But Jesus came and John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God, lambs, lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Totally different, this is new covenant. Old covenant, sins are covered. And if you placed your hand on the lamb when he was being killed, that would forgive your sins. Your sins would be covered by the blood of the lamb. What's God say now? Believe in my son who died for you. He's the lamb of God. Believe in him and your sins won't just be covered. They'll be taken away. This is what Paul preached. But he said here, they're ignorant of that. They're still back here. Still doing these things. And they're ignorant of the fact that Jesus came. So Paul's desire was for his own people to see what Jesus had done. So Jesus was always the focus of this preaching. All right, I think I wrote it here. So, brethren, my heart's desire, prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear the record that they have a zeal of God. Yeah, they're still offering sacrifices, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Keep going here. So why did Paul enter the synagogue? Number one, because his heart was for Israel. So he went to them first. Remember what Paul said one time? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. In his mind, he was always, Jews, you've got to receive it. But I'm also going to talk to those who are not Jews. Now, here's an interesting thing. Number two, Paul's point of contact. And I want to camp on this for just a minute. Why did Paul go to the synagogues? Because he, his heart was that they would believe. But also, that was his point of contact. That was his training. That's how he made contact with people. What Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, For though I am free from all men, yet I have made myself servant to all, so that I may gain more. Now watch the word gain here. Unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I may gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I may gain them that are without the law. Do you hear the word gain in there a lot? Why did he do this? Why did he go to the Jews? Then to these, these people. Because he wanted them to hear the good news. To the weak became I weak, that I may gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do this for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers thereof with you. You see Paul's heart here? His whole ambition was, I gotta make contact. Oh, there's somebody, he's a Jew, I'm gonna go to him as a Jew and I'm gonna talk to him. Oh, there's a Gentile, I'm gonna talk to him as a Gentile. Oh, there's a weak person, I'm gonna go as a weak person. You hear what he's doing? He's looking for ways of contact. And he describes them. So let me ask you this question. How should we reach others? We've already seen how Paul did that. He identified with different people. He listened to their story. 
I think the first one is to pray. We're going to use Paul as an example here. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. He's talking about us praying for one another. And then he says this, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You know what Paul did? He asked the people in Ephesus to pray for him. Now, where is Paul? He's in jail. And he's asking them, please pray that I would have boldness. Wait a minute. This is the great apostle Paul, and he's asking people to pray for him? That he would be bold? Listen, if the apostle Paul needed prayer to be bold, how about you and how about me? We need prayer too. And this is what Paul is saying. Pray for one another that we have boldness. Some of you have family members that aren't walking with the Lord. Don't know the Lord. You know what Paul says here? Get someone to start praying for you. Get in a prayer group and say, I need prayer. I need you to pray for me that I'll have the right words, that I'll have the, the divine appointment, that I can talk to my family member or a friend at work or somebody I know. Look, if the Apostle Paul asked for prayer, that he would be bold. You and I need to pray as well in that same way. So Paul here makes it a point to go where the people are that he can make contact with. So how should we reach other people? Well, number one, we should pray. Get people to pray for you. If you're going to go talk to a family member, call up somebody on the phone and say, hey, I'm going to go talk to my family member. Can you please pray for me? Would you please back me in prayer? Here's a number two. How should we reach others with the gospel? Well, we recognize God's purpose. And this was on Paul's mind because he wrote to the Ephesians, for I am an ambassador in bonds. Right after he asked them to pray, he said, I'm an ambassador. <coughs> What's an ambassador? It's someone who leaves his home country, goes to another, but represents the home country <coughs> to them. That's what ambassadors are. Paul called himself an ambassador. In what way was he an ambassador? What was he doing? He was representing the kingdom of God wherever he was in whatever country. He was the ambassador for God in that country. Are you following me here? So he called himself an ambassador. And you may sit back and go, well, that's great. Also, Paul was an ambassador. Yeah, but look what he says in 2 Corinthians. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. You know what he's saying here? You know how you reach the people around you? You have to keep in mind you're an ambassador. You're here for a reason to represent another kingdom here. That's what ambassadors do. If we have something that, let's say our president wants to, has a problem with some country, you know what they do? He calls up the ambassador. Hey, uh, what you guys are doing, uh, we need to talk about this. You call your ambassador who represents that country. When people need to know about the Lord, how are they going to know about the Lord? They're going to have to learn through the ambassadors that are sitting here today representing their home country. Listen, the only way we're going to reach others is by recognizing we have to be ambassadors. This is not a passive job. This is active. You see what I'm saying? We walk out the door of the church. We're an ambassador. You talk to your neighbor. You're an ambassador. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. He says, we're ambassadors, just like God is speaking through us to you. No matter where we go, we represent God. Number three, how do we reach others? Hebrews says this, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. You know, you know what the writer says here? 
We need to identify with others. When Paul would walk into the synagogue, he identified with them as a fellow Jew, and he was there because he was an ambassador of God, and he was there to tell them about the new covenant. So they could think back on all this stuff they had learned in their Judaism, and they could say, oh, and Jesus fulfilled all that? Great. See, Paul saw himself as an ambassador, identifying. Let brotherly love continue. You know, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. I often tell this story, I told it before. My parents were missionaries, and during a very difficult time in their life, I can remember it, we had a couple come to visit us. Then they drove, I remember they drove a Volkswagen minibus, I guess is what you call them. They drove it, they stayed with us about two weeks. The lady helped my mother. My mother had this table where she would sew her clothes and sew things. My mother loved to sew, cook. And then the guy helped my dad because my dad liked to fix cars and <laughs> build stuff. And he went with him on trips. They stayed with us about two weeks. They were an incredible encouragement to my parents. They just lived with us. They showed up at our door and knocked. And they said, hi, we're so-and-so, and we're here to just, is there anything we can do? And my, of course, my parents said, yeah, come on in. We have an extra bedroom. Stay with us. They encouraged my parents at a very difficult time in their life. Then they left. You know what? My parents never heard from them again. In fact, this is, my dad was quite a rascal. He, he went out to their car when they weren't watching, and he looked at their registration to see where they were actually from, because their license plate was Canada. And uh, we're not Canadians, right? So he looked and it was like such and such Montreal, whatever. And my dad was, he just liked to check into things, so he wrote it down. And about a year later, when he was up in Canada at a meeting, he was at some mission conference in Montreal, he looked up the address. <laughs> and he actually went to the address. They weren't there. They didn't live at that address. There was no such people. He asked the people, have you ever seen Mr. and Mrs. You know, Jones or whatever? No. They say they lived, I thought they lived here. No. We've lived here all our lives. Who were these people? Yeah. They had an address for the registration of the car, I guess. You know what my dad always thought? They were angels. Yeah. They came at a time. Now, what if my parents would say, Canadians? Ah, we're not Canadians. <laughs> we're down the road. <laughs> Y'all, we don't speak the way you do. You know, we don't eat your food. You're different than we are. You're, you're from the North Country. Just keep moving. No, my parents opened the door and let them in. They were an incredible ministry. Now, you may try and poke holes through that story, but I know it's true that my parents never found out who they were, never saw them again, angels. Folks, listen, go up and like, I don't know, Earl, can I pinch you? Are you are you really alive? Are you a, an angel in disguise? I don't know. Maybe Earl's an angel. What do you think, Sherry? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe, well, we won't go there, right? <laughs> Sometimes, okay, there you go. Folks, this is what Paul was all about. Paul was all about making contact with people and seeing God work. It may be that somebody who walks into our life for a certain time is an angel from God just sent to encourage us. Dustin Wills wrote this. Listen to this. The aim of hospitality, hospitality simply means opening your home or being open, welcoming is to build relationships strong enough to bear the weight of truth. Listen to that. Sometimes we like to spout out truth without a relationship. And you know what that does? It just drives people away. He says here, the aim of getting to know someone, having the contact, friendship, is that that relationship is strong enough to bear the weight of truth. Truth is heavy. You gotta have a relationship that will hold will bear that. We had a pastor in Flagstaff who used to say, like a train travels on rails, you know? <laughs> truth travels on relationships. If you have the truth but no relationship, you're gonna have a train wreck. You gotta have the relationship for the truth to travel on. 
But you may say, well, relationships take a long time. They're hard. Yeah? Why do you think Paul went to the synagogues? Started there. And then from there he branched out. Why do you think he climbed 3,600 feet? 100 mile trip from the coast to the mountain. Why would he do that? Because he wanted to build strong relationships with people. Here's another one. Alexander Strach says, an open home is a sign of an open heart and a loving sacrificial spirit. Lack of hospitality is a true sign of selfishness, lifeless, loveless Christianity. I'm only throwing this up because some of these guys have ways of saying things that hit hard. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to have people in their house all the time, but we're talking about an attitude of openness. An open home is a sign of an open heart. It doesn't have to be your own home, but it could be just the way you are. You welcome people. You're not afraid to get to know new people. But a lack of that closing off is a sure sign of selfish, lifeless, loveless Christianity. Oh, let that sink in. I know I'm convicted by that. I wish all of you could be over my house every day, you know, but I know we have constraints, right? (laughs) But here's a caution. Let's be careful not to treat our neighbors as projects. Do you understand what that means? We don't want to come across like, okay, I'm going to get to know you because I have something really heavy to lay on you. Uh, Be careful of that. Be careful. We care for people for who they are. They're created in the image of God and not for who they might become, children of God. We care for them because they're children of God. Not just because of what we hope they become. Yeah, we hope God changes their heart. Yeah, we hope God does something in their life, right? That's, we're not being friends for an ulterior motive. We're being friends so we can share with them, yes, at the appropriate time. So let's be careful with that. So what do you think Paul did? Could they stand back and say, oh, I know why he came to the synagogue. Because he just wanted to get to know people and get a platform and then bring in his new teaching. No. Paul did it genuinely. He cared for the people of Israel. How can we reach others with the gospel? I just want to talk about this for a minute. I know it's not in the text, but Paul did go to the synagogues because he had a message to preach. You know that Paul answers that question? How should we reach others? Here's the gospel according to Paul. Let me read it for you in 1 Corinthians 15. Some of you say, well, I don't know what the gospel is. What is the good news that I'm supposed to share with people as an ambassador? Well, Paul made it real clear in 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what he said. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Here it is. Here's the gospel. Paul makes it so clear. I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which you received and wherein you stand, by whom also you were saved, if you keep the memory of what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, here it is, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So here are the questions that Paul's going to answer. Who is Jesus? Who is he? What did he do? Why did he do it? How do we know it's true? And what do I need to do about it? There's five things that Paul talks about. Real simple. And if you can get a handle on these five, you've got the gospel. You don't have to say, well, I don't know what I should say. Paul said, here's the gospel. Here it is. Who is Jesus? Well, he is the Christ. What's the Christ? He's the one sent from God. So there's the answer to the first question. Who's Jesus? He's the one that God sent here. You can say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved us. He sent his son. 
What did he do? He died for our sins according to the scriptures. So what did Jesus do? He was the sacrifice lamb. Before we had those lambs, now we have the lamb of God. Who's Jesus? Came from God. He offered himself as a sacrifice. Why did he do this? So why? He did this according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. Why did he do this? For our sins. So you and I have a sin problem that only Jesus could take care of. In the Old Testament, the lambs took care of the sin, covered the blood. Jesus came. Who is he? Let's go back through it. Who's Jesus? The Christ sent from God. What did he do? He died. He came here and died for our sins. Why did he do it? Because we had sins that only he could take care of. You see, a person that doesn't know God is walking around with their sins. They have no way of getting rid of their sins. No amount of work, the Bible says, not by works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace, not us. No matter how much good stuff we do, I was talking to Cindy a little bit earlier about a guy who is trying to do some good things, and bless his heart, he's trying but as I talk to him, and I need wisdom to know how to do this, he, he really has a big heart and he wants to help people. But that's not going to get him to heaven, folks. It's not. And I've been able to talk to him, and he's getting closer and closer to understanding the message. Who is Jesus? What did he do? Why did he do it? Because you and I can't take care of our sins on our, on our, by ourselves. How do we know this is true? That's the big question here. How do we know it's true that he died and rose again? How do we know this? Well, Paul says this. It says, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, he was seen of 500 brethren at once. The greater part remain to this day. How do we know it's true? Eyewitnesses. In fact, when Paul wrote this, there were people still living that saw it. And they could easily say to Paul, Paul, that's not right. I was there. No. They're eyewitnesses to the fact that this is true. That's why Paul says, they're still at walk. You don't believe me? Go ask them. They saw it too. How do we know this is true? Eyewitnesses. Now, how do we respond? What do we need to do? Well, he says... You receive and stand in it, verse 1. What do you do? What do you do with the fact that Jesus came and died and offered himself a sacrifice for your sin? What do you need to do? You need to receive it. It's a gift that he offers you. Take it. Stand in it, he says. Stand firm in that fact that Jesus died for your sins. So, what was Paul doing when he walked into those synagogues? Next week we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, I did tell you I was going to talk about standing. Um, there's a tradition in the synagogues that to re when you read the word, you stood to read it. Now, we're doing kind of the opposite because I'm standing the whole time, but the rabbis, and they still do this in many of the Messianic fellowships, they stand to read the word, and they have two readings. They have the law and the prophets. So they read those two, the Torah and then the prophets. And then when they go to expound, they sit down. The rabbis sit and they teach. Okay, so you stand for the word, you sit for the teaching. This happened to Jesus when he went to the synagogue in Nazareth. And they had the readings. And so they looked around and they said, oh, oh, young man, why don't you come up and do the reading? And they asked Jesus to do the reading from the law and the prophets. And it just so happened because they read through the entire Torah and prophets in one year. There's a cycle that they read. So they break it up into 50 different sections, 52, for every week of the year. And that way they read through the entire Old Testament through the year. Kind of a neat thing, Bible reading. So when Jesus walked in, they said, young man, come up and here's the reading for today. And it was in the book of Isaiah. Well, from the Torah first, then Isaiah. And it was exactly what Jesus 
It talked about the one who was coming, who would open the blind, open the eyes of the blind. It, and so he said, this day, he said, once he read it, he sat down and he said, this day, this is fulfilled in your eyes. <clears throat> and it says, all eyes were fixed. You know why? Because he was saying, what I just read today, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> of course, they didn't get real happy about that. I think they ran him out of town or something. <laughs> But what was he doing? He was taking the reading from the day and expounding on it. So when Paul gets here, he does something different. And if you look at verse 13, or verse 14, <coughs> what does he do? Look at the difference. He, he changed it up a little bit. What did he do? <coughs> All right. 14. They departed from Perga, came to Antioch, went into the Sabbath, sat down. After the reading of the law, so whoever was doing the reading, we don't know. <coughs> they said, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue, sent to them saying, you men and brethren, if you have a word for the people, say on. Now tradition was they stood to read, sit to preach. What's Paul do? Then Paul sat down. Is that what it says? Verse 16, stood up. He broke with tradition. <laughs> Uh-oh. Is it okay to break with tradition? Is it okay to change things up? Where does it say you have to stand to read and sit to preach? Obviously, I'm breaking that, right? Because <laughs> I'm standing. You all are sitting. We'll talk about that next week. When is it okay to change things up? Is it okay to change the chairs that we're not looking that way? Now we're looking somewhere. Is it okay to change the curtains? Is it okay to hang things differently at different times of the year? Sure it is. If it helps you to worship. <coughs> Are you following me here? Paul had something so important to say, he wasn't going to sit down to say it. He stood and he beckoned them with his hands. So he must have been a preacher that really used his hand. I don't know. Now, let's talk about some application. Are you willing to do what it takes to share the gospel? Paul walked 100 miles, 3,600 feet elevation to share the gospel. You say, oh, that's too much. I could never do that. Okay, you don't have to walk from Mesa to Cordes on foot. But what can you do? What can you do to share the gospel? Here's another one. What are your points of contact with people? Paul had the point of, I'm a Jew. I'm going to go look for Jews. I'll start there. <coughs> we know he was also a tent maker. He knew how to make tents. In one of the travels we're going to look at later, he spends time in a business building tents because he knew how to do it. That was his point of contact. What's your point of contact? Ask God, God, what do, how have you made me uniquely? And I want you to use that unique way that you've created me to meet other people or to bless and help other people uniquely. You know, I'm amazed when I look at the food bank. We have ladies in there doing the laptops. That's stuff I can't do. <laughs> we have these Set three guys moving pallets. Oh, 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 you know, I can't do that. We have people moving vegetables and <laughs> produce. Everyone has their abilities. We have other guys working on the electrical and fixing outlets, and that's amazing. We have guys taking care of the freezer, right? <laughs> Making sure that it stays cold. That's way over my ability level. I can't change capacitor. This week, by the way, the freezer went down oh. and it, the temperature started rising and they had to change the capacitor. I can't do that. Somebody did. Somebody knew how to do it. Listen, what is your point of contact? What has, how has God made you? And ask God, how do you want, how, Lord, how can I be used with this unique ability you've given me? How can I reach out? 
how's your ambassador role going? Do you see yourself as an ambassador? Yes. You're living in this world. Paul said in Philippians, we're citizens, our citizenship is in heaven. Technically, when you become a believer, you've got a new citizenship, but you're just here as an ambassador. Okay? You are left here to represent your citizenship, which is in heaven. How's it going? Ask the question. How about the people at your workplace? How about the people in the store? Do they know you're believers? Do they know you're an ambassador from a foreign country? Or do they see you as just one of everybody? That's an important question to ask. Remember, we're not supposed to be weird. We're supposed to be different, <laughs> right? Not weird, different. Our speech, our attitudes, everything is different. That's why Peter said that everyone should make the Lord Lord in their hearts and be ready to answer anyone who asks you a reason of the hope. As you live differently, people are going to ask, what's different about you? <clears throat> How come you... Whatever. Have you heard the gospel and responded? That's the one thing I want to just really camp on. Have you heard this gospel? Because it's easy to sit in the church. <coughs> Excuse me. It's easy to sit in the church and hear messages. But really, this is the most important message. Have you heard the message that God sent Jesus? He died on the cross. He took your sins on that cross, something you could not do yourself. And have you responded to that? As many as received him, the Bible says in John 1, 14, he gave the privilege to be called the sons of God. You have to receive, and that's how you become. Have you heard the gospel, and have you responded? That's a personal question. I would say out of everything that I say, that's the most important thing. Remember John 3.14. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to take a little sip here. That's the serpent in the wilderness. Remember we've talked about this before. Jesus said to Nicodemus, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is Numbers chapter 21, and it's the case where the children of Israel are murmuring, and God's fed up with it, and he sends serpents into the camp. And they start biting people, and people are dying. It's judgment for their murmuring. And Moses goes to God, and he says, God, help us. And God says, okay, here's what you do. Get a pole, get a serpent, make it out of brass, put it on a pole. And it so happens that when somebody is bitten, <clears throat> all they need to do, they need to look at the pole, look at the serpent, and they'll be healed. How simple is that? You get bit by a serpent, you go outside your tent, because the serpents were everywhere, you look at the pole, and you are healed. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So it's a comparison. The word as means comparison. Moses lifted up a serpent. I'm going to be lifted up. So remember, there's three things. There's a problem, there's a solution, and there's a response. We're making it real basic. What was the problem? Over here, they were being bitten by snakes. What was the solution? Moses was to put a serpent on a pole. But that didn't heal anybody until they responded. So there's a problem, a solution, and a response. Response, you had to look at the pole. And there were probably people that were told, hey, you got bit, go look at the pole, man. Oh, that is so stupid. <laughs> looking at a pole, looking at a pole, are you serious? You want me to waste my time going out of the tent and looking at a pole? I'm using my imagination, right? <clears throat> so, problem, snake bite. Solution, serpent on a pole. Response, look at it. As Moses lifted up, even so must the Son of Man. So what's the problem? Sin. What's the solution? 
Jesus died on the cross. What's the response? You've got to look at it. You have to have faith that what God has said is true. Just today, just even today, we have people going, that is really stupid. <laughs> you mean looking at the fact that Jesus died on the cross is going to take my sins away? Are you kidding me? See what I'm saying? Problem, solution, response. Problem, solution, response. <clears throat> So here's my question. Have you responded to the solution that God's provided? That's where the rubber meets the road. So would you bow your heads with me? Let me pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for this passage. It reminds us of just the importance of the sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross. <clears throat> and the importance also of being committed to sharing this gospel, this good news of who Jesus is and what he did and why he did it and how we know it's true and what we need to do to, how we need to respond. Lord, give us boldness. If the Apostle Paul asked for boldness, we need boldness too. <clears throat> to see ourselves as ambassadors, see, us, see ourselves as here for a reason to represent the kingdom of God in a world that doesn't know him, doesn't know the kingdom. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who, who just has not made that decision, that they would do that today. What an important decision to turn your life over to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I appreciate what you did for me on the cross. I didn't do anything to deserve it, but I am so grateful that I can receive it, receive this free gift. Lord, I pray that they would do that today. I wouldn't leave this place without making that decision, the most important decision of their lives. So, Lord, as we go through this week, we pray that you would use us in a mighty way, <clears throat> use us as ambassadors, and if we have to climb those 3,600 feet to get to a town to talk to them, Lord, give us the courage, the energy to do that. The courage and the energy to just share with people the most important, life-changing decision of their lives. And then, let's say, make that decision. The Holy Spirit comes to live within them and the Holy Spirit guides. And you've come to give us life and life abundantly. You promise to walk with us through all the experiences of life. What a great journey. So Lord, thank you for this time. And again, we pray that the town of Paulden and Chino and others would know there's, there's a living God who meets with his children here and then walks with us during the week, helping our thoughts and actions to reflect you to people that need to know you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and stand with us, folks, and let's sing a closing song.
bless all of you. Have a great week. If you want to stay for our fellowship time, the ladies have made a great meal. Just ask Jim. He's always the first one there, right, Jim? There you go.